Welcome back, my friends. In this session, I'd like to address one of the great challenges in our modern world, and that's anger and blame. And really, this is what drives violence between societal groups and distances us from each other. Letting go of blame, forgiveness, is a crucial part of most spiritual and religious teachings, and it's quite difficult. Most of us believe that forgiveness is a great idea until we really have something to forgive. I talked about the trance of unworthiness, how when we're judgmental and unforgiving towards ourselves, we're in a prison of trance. Well, similarly, when we're caught in aversive judgment and blame outward, we're in a trance. The aperture of our attention has narrowed and the other becomes what I call an unreal other. Um, By that I mean we only see what's wrong about them. We, We lose sight of their dimensionality, of how they're vulnerable as humans, and also their goodness. And of course we become an unreal self, and by that I mean we contract into the identity of the judge, the victim, the wrong self. And interestingly, When we're in that state of resentment, judgment, and blame, the learning centers in our prefrontal cortex are deactivated. In other words, we don't learn this so much and take in new information. Okay, so remember the statue of the Golden Buddha? When we're in the grip of anger and blame and aversion, we're identified with the coverings. We're cut off from the gold and really from creativity and learning and compassion and love, really from our sense of wholeness. We're not at home with ourselves and we're certainly not at home with others. Now, while it's painful and imprisoning, it's important to remember that anger and blame are a natural reaction from our survival brain. It's a way to try to control when we feel threatened, to protect ourselves from more injury and from wrongdoing. So we need anger. It's intelligent. It alerts us to blocks to our well-being and to the well-being of others. And it moves us to act and to set healthy boundaries. The problem is when anger and blame become a habit, It's like the on button gets jammed, and then we're unable to move past them to constructive, life-enhancing resolution and to action that's really wise. And in a deep way, our spiritual unfolding freezes. We're not able to bring healing to the wounding that's underneath or behind our anger and to move towards peace. So the first step to moving past blame is to honestly face the misunderstandings and fears that hold us to our armoring. So the first step to moving past blame is to honestly face the misunderstandings and fears that keep us holding tightly to our armoring. So I'd like you to reflect for a moment, Uh, this is a really valuable inquiry, to consider for yourself, and if it helps you to close your eyes as you do this, please do, to consider where you're carrying some deep sense of resentment, blame, some grievance towards another, to bring that to mind. Pick one person where you're aware of that kind of a feeling of resentment or blame. And then to ask yourself, what would I have to feel if I put aside my anger? What would I have to feel if I wasn't making the other person wrong are bad in some way. So 
sense what you might have to experience that's difficult if you stopped blaming the other person, if you stopped considering them as wrong or bad. Now perhaps as you do that, what you find is that underneath the blame there's a feeling of hurt, and you'd have to face that hurt. Maybe there's grief. Maybe you feel a sense of powerlessness. Maybe you feel without your blame you'd be at risk for further injury, that something else bad might happen. Or maybe you're sensing, well, if they're not wrong and bad, maybe it's me. There's a lot of vulnerability underneath our blaming. And it's really important that we see what the blame is covering over. And there's this misunderstanding that if we let go of our blame, that in some way we're justifying the other person or we're condoning their behavior. We're saying, all right, you're right and I'm wrong. But that's not the case. Letting go of blame does not mean that you're going to let somebody get away with something again, that you're giving them the green light to do it. You can absolutely, you can forgive. You can release anger, hatred, and blame, and also say, never again will I knowingly allow this to happen. You can resolve to create whatever boundaries you need to make, to sacrifice whatever you need to sacrifice to prevent further harm. And often it involves creating appropriate boundaries, and maybe it's to never speak with someone again or spend time with them. But we don't have to carry the anger and the hate to take care of ourselves and each other, and that is important to know. It really helps to understand the difference between wise discrimination and judgment and blame. Now, wise discrimination might say, well, that person behaves that way and that's bad behavior because it's hurtful. And then you know you need to respond and take care of yourself. But that's different than judgment and blame that makes the other person a bad person. You see the difference? It's not about bad behavior. It becomes that person is bad. And then our hearts get tight and there's a pushing away of the other. So the big question then is what's, what really is getting in the way from letting go of aversive blame? What keeps us hooked on considering the other person as a bad person? And what we find is we don't want to soften and open our heart and then have to feel that pain and vulnerability that's underneath our armor. Forgiving is hard. It means releasing armor and really opening to the lifelong wound sometimes of our heart. And we can't force it. I found that premature forgiveness is actually a form of denial or avoidance. And it's really important to honor if we're on this path of forgiveness, and this is particularly when it comes to trauma, that it's very gradual. Um, We need to respect anger as a necessary phase before we try to open to forgiveness. Because otherwise, the message is, well, to be spiritual, you should forgive. But if someone's not yet ready organically, it turns into shame. I'm not a good spiritual person because I'm not forgiving. We need to respect. It's gradual. And for many, it's a life process because we get re-triggered and we re-armor over and over again. We need to keep on letting go over and over again, and it can take many years. It can require therapeutic support, um, go through many stages, Forgiveness is sometimes takes this phase of, of rage and then grief and sorrow. We can feel fear. But here's what I have found throughout the process. 
you can intend to forgive. And I've seen over and over how the intention to forgive opens the door. It begins the softening and letting go in the heart. Okay, so what motivates us to forgive? While it's natural to armor ourselves when we're wounded, this armoring becomes its own suffering. And there is an intelligence in you that knows that, that knows that as long as you're carrying resentment and anger, your heart's going to be closed and your loving is going to be limited. There's not real peace inside. So we forgive for our own spiritual freedom, for our own healing, for the lightening of the heart. Now, let's look more closely at how forgiveness actually works. And there's a lot of research on this, and it shows that forgiving isn't sudden, it's gradual, and it's usually preceded by some experience of self-compassion and self-forgiveness. Now, this might seem counterintuitive because we're thinking, well, it's the other person that did wrong, But internally, we often, in a deep way, turn on ourselves. So forgiving others usually begins with some quality of care and compassion to the wounded parts of ourself. I think of this as a U-turn, and you might imagine it this way, that when we're reactive and blaming someone, our attention is all fixated outward on the bad other all of our stories, everything, all the energies aimed out towards the bad other. But when we begin to forgive, and we'll do this with rain, we actually shift from this outer focus, we make a U-turn back to our own hearts to find out what's under the blame. And once you've brought mindfulness and compassion to the woundedness under the blame, then you can see with fresh eyes, really, the real other, who the other person really is. Let me share a story now on how RAIN can help us make this shift from the kind of limbic reactivity of blame to a mature and wise and forgiving response. And this story, A man uh, grew up with a very emotionally abusive father. He was controlling and judgmental, and he regularly berated his son. And he had been very sensitive as a child, artistic, um, good at writing, but not the kind of male his father most respected. So he felt a lot of anger about that, a lot of anger at not really feeling respected. Well, after, you know, he was an adult, his father had a heart attack at one point, and that really limited his life. He had to retire, and he was frustrated and depressed. And this man was very unsympathetic. Uh, you know, he he's said, well, he created his life. And um, his sister challenged him. She said, can't you be forgiving? And he was outraged. He said, he'll never know how much suffering he's caused me. He'll get away with it. He doesn't deserve my forgiveness. If I forgive him, it's like, he's right and I'm bad. Well, he came to a meditation retreat with us. And we practiced rain. I introduced it there. And he decided to bring rain to this whole mix of anger and um, blame, rain to blame. And so the way he practiced, and we practiced together, and then he practiced through the retreat, with the R, he would recognize whatever judgment or blame was going through his mind. The A was he'd allow it to be there. You know, as I mentioned, um, anger's intelligent, and we need to honor it. So he would just say, okay, this belongs, let it be here. And then he'd investigate. And he asked the question I just asked you. He said, well, if I put aside the blaming thoughts and the anger, what would I have to feel that's painful? And he found underneath the blame was a deep, deep hurt. I wasn't 
strong enough or special enough or good enough for him to really love me and respect me. So there was hurt. And he found as he investigated in his body a feeling of grieving, of never having a father who cared and saw him really for who he was. So this set the the tenderness for nurturing. He asked himself, well, what does this wounded place need? And it told him basically to put his hand on his heart and offer a real message of care, to trust his goodness, that he's lovable, and to send a sense of warmth and loving to his inner heart. So during the retreat, I could see him there sitting with his hand on his heart for many, many meditations. He was really processing a lot. And when we practiced after the rain, he realized after doing those four steps that each time he had some shift from feeling like the victim, like he had been mistreated, he was a small self that was mistreated, like the victim, and at the end of rain, he always felt more of a spaciousness, more of a sense of compassion, because he had been holding his own heart in a field of compassion. Well, he left the retreat feeling a lot more tender and alive and at home in himself, less armored, and it showed up at home. When he was with his father, he kind of saw him through new eyes. He could see his, how his father's restlessness and anxiety and loneliness uh, were circling around, and he could sense how his father was afraid of vulnerability in himself and had been afraid of his own vulnerability as a child. And so he realized for his father, he was afraid. His father was afraid that his vulnerable son would have a hard time, and that made him uh, really act in disrespectful ways. Well, there was a marked shift in their time together. This man, seeing his father's own vulnerability, he loosened up, and they had some jokes together, and there were some small kindnesses, so things loosened up. And then his father had a more serious heart attack. And while he was recovering, this man kept his father company. He'd go over and read to him on many days. And one afternoon, he was reading the newspaper to his father, and his father asked him to stop. And he said, I'm sorry, I wasn't there for you. And there was this long silence, and his father had tears in his eyes. This man heard the words he never thought he'd hear. His father said, you probably don't know how much I love you. And this man told me, he said, Tara, by forgiving him, it made him safe enough to feel his heart. I don't share this with you because the message is not that if you forgive someone, they'll come around and be who you want them to be, because it doesn't necessarily happen that way. When you forgive and let go of blame, you open up to be more of who you really are. And sometimes the ripples of that can affect another person in a profoundly healing way. But the only way to start is to start with the wounded place, to open to where you feel hurt or vulnerable inside with compassion. And then you can start seeing the other in a much more true way. I often share a a metaphor that touched me um, of a man walking in the woods and seeing a dog under a tree and small dog and went over to pet it and it lurched at him and his fangs were bared. And so rather than feeling friendly anymore, he was angry at the dog and he backed off, bad dog, you know. And then he saw that the dog had its paw in a trap. And then his heart shifted again. You know, oh, you poor thing. Now, he didn't necessarily step in close. He had to keep some boundaries because the dog could be dangerous. But his heart wasn't armored any longer. When we are reacting to someone, 
because of their bad behavior, their leg is most probably in a trap. And if we can see that, it's going to change our response. When you're reacting to yourself, when you're judging yourself for your own ways of behaving that you don't like, your leg, in some way, is in a trap. You're hurting in some way, or you wouldn't be behaving that way. I mean, when we're feeling happy and peaceful and open, we don't generally go around hurting other people or hurting ourselves. I love the way Henry Wadsworth Longfellow put it. He said, if we could read the secret history of our enemies, we should find in each man's life suffering and sorrow enough to disarm all hostility. So people often ask me, yes, but what of really terrible violations of, you know, mass murder, sexual abuse of children, doesn't punishing help? And it's actually the same truth, that anyone who causes suffering is on some level suffering. And our blame and hatred continues to fuel the cycles of violence. It locks us in a trance of our own conditioning. Many years ago, I saw a movie of an African ritual. It's called The Drowning Man's Trial. And as that ritual goes, if someone's murdered, the killer is taken to the river. They go out on a boat to the middle of the river. The killer's arms and legs are bound so they can't swim and they're dropped in the water. And the family of the dead have to make a choice. They can either let him drown or they can swim out and save him. And those that created the ritual believe that if they let the killer drown, they'll have justice, but spend the rest of their life in mourning. But instead, if they admit that life isn't necessarily just, that very act can take away their sorrow. In fact, they have a saying, it's vengeance, is a lazy form of grief. So blame, hatred, judgment, aversion, we can't heal ourselves or make peace. It's just the cycles get sustained of violence. Maha Gosananda was a monk who led peace marches throughout Cambodia after the great massacres of the Cambodian people and after those killings, these people were in refugee camps, about 50,000 in a camp, huge, great heat, and they were surrounded by barbed wire. And they were told that if they gathered for prayer, that they would be shot by the Khmer Rouge. But Maha Gosananda took the risk and set up a temporary temple, and he rang the temple bells, and thousands gathered. And he began to chant in Cambodian and in Sanskrit this simple chant that is really one of the first verses of the Buddhist teachings. It goes like this, Hatred never ceases by hatred, but by love alone is healed. Hatred never ceases by hatred, but by love alone is healed. And he chanted it over and over again. And slowly the voices began to pick up the chant with him. And pretty soon 25,000 people were singing this and weeping because it had been 10 years since they had heard the Dharma, heard these teachings, these truths. And they were truths greater than their suffering. They were the way of love. We can see the suffering in our world today, the cycles of violence all over the planet, where whether it's the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda, the Bosnians and the Serbs and Croats, Palestinians and Israelis, continue to sentence their children and their children's children to suffering and conflict. There were two prisoners of war who met again later after many years, and one said that to the other, have you forgiven our captors yet? And the second one answers through gritted teeth, no, never. And the first one looked at him kindly and said, well then, 
they still have you in prison, don't they? Our blame imprisons us. It armors our heart. It keeps us from the gold. And yet, as we'll explore in our meditation, if we train our hearts and minds, we can release this armoring. We can live from a forgiving heart. One last story for you, and then we'll practice. I I live right outside of Washington, D.C., and there's a lot of gang violence. And some years back, one 14-year-old boy had shot and killed an innocent teenager to prove himself to his gang. And at the trial, his the victim's mother sat silently watching the proceedings. And at the end of the trial, after the verdict was announced and the youth was convicted, she stood up slowly. She stared at him and said, I'm going to kill you. Then the youth was taken away to serve several years in a juvenile facility. After the first half year, the mother of the slain child went to visit his killer. And he had been living on the streets before the killing. She was the only visitor he had. So they talked for a bit, and then she gave him some money for snacks. She started to step-by-step visit him more regularly, bringing food and small gifts. And near the end of the three-year sentence, she asked him what he'd be doing when he got out. And he was confused and uncertain. So she offered to set him up with a job at a friend's company. And then she inquired where he'd be living. And since he had no family to return to, she offered him temporary use of the spare room in her house. Well, for eight months, he lived there, he ate her food, he worked at the job. And then one evening, she called him into the living room to talk. And she sat down opposite him and waited a bit. And then she said, do you remember in the courtroom when I said, I'm going to kill you? I sure do, he responded. Well, I did, she went on. I didn't want the boy who could kill my son for no reason to remain alive on this earth. I wanted him to die. That's why I started to visit you and bring you things. And that's why I got you the job and let you live here in my house. That's how I said about changing you. And that old boy, he's gone. So now I want to ask you, since my son is gone, and since that killer is gone, if you'll stay here. I've got room, and I'd like to adopt you if you'll let me. And she became the mother of her son's killer, the mother he had never had. We might listen and wonder, well, could I respond like this? And I certainly don't know for myself. But what's important is that we have this capacity to awaken a deeply forgiving heart. And as we do, we bring more love and peace and understanding into our angry, divided world. So we'll practice now, and we'll practice what I call bringing rain to blame. Please find a comfortable way to sit so that you're alert and yet relaxed and at ease. And you might close your eyes and take a few full breaths to collect your attention. And now identify a situation in your life where you're feeling some sense of conflict resentment and blame. I don't recommend something where it's full-blown rage or hatred and involves traumatic suffering, because that won't serve. Some situation where you're feeling blame, resentment.
once you have the person in mind, let a very particular incident come to mind that might have triggered your anger. And notice where you are, what room you're in, the surroundings. And remind yourself of what was going on. Perhaps the words exchanged and the tone of voice. The look on the person's face. And whatever felt like the worst part of what was going on. And now making the U-turn of rain, bringing the attention to yourself, we begin with recognize, noticing what are the most predominant feelings or reactions going on inside you. And you can name them with a mental whisper. It might be naming anger, blame, judgment, resentment. Then we follow with allowing, consciously letting whatever the experience is to be there, not adding judgment, not trying to fix it, not trying to ignore it, but letting it be there, sensing that whatever reaction there is deserves your respect, that you listen, that you attend, that there's always an intelligence So allowing, making space for whatever has come up, we begin to investigate. And you might ask yourself, when this is going on, what am I believing about myself or what am I believing about the other person? Is it that they don't really respect you or care about you? They don't understand. What do you believe in? And remind yourself of what's the worst part of this? What feels most disturbing or hurtful? Most threatening? What were you hoping for, or wanting, or expecting that didn't happen in the exchange or in the relationship? And as you ask these questions, sense where you feel feelings most fully in your body. Where do you feel the anger, the blame, disappointment? And you might let your face express the feelings that you feel. Experiment with that. If it's anger, you might feel the tightening at the brow, the clenching of the jaw, the tensing of the face. You might even let your posture express what you're feeling, to get more in touch with it. For some, that means hunching their shoulders or making fists.
feeling into the place in your body where you most feel whatever is strongest. And you might place your hand there, the throat, the chest, the belly, to keep your attention sustained. Bring that interest and courage to really feeling what's underneath the blame, the anger. What does that vulnerable place feel like? What's really there? What's the unmet need? Is it to feel cared about? Seen? Respected? Valued? Important? Appreciated? Safe? with this U-turn deepening to listen inwardly to the most vulnerable part of you, that which is underneath the anger. And then beginning to offer nurturing or care to the place that feels vulnerable. You might sense What does that place most need to hear and feel right now? And offer a message of comfort, of healing. And if it's hard to do it for yourself, you might imagine someone else, a person you trust and love, a spiritual figure, offering care to whatever feels most vulnerable within you. And again, the hand, perhaps on the heart, let the touch be tender. And let your intention be to explore what it means to let in care. Letting in kindness, compassion to that place underneath the anger that is hurt, fearful, distressed. Letting the care really bathe that place. The final part of the practice after the rain means that you just sense the quality of presence that has emerged, whatever degree of presence and heart is here. There might be just a little more space and tenderness, or you might feel a real shift from being perhaps a victim to really a heart space, a field of compassion. And now begin to witness the other with clear eyes, with an open heart, and again with rain to recognize the other's behavior, their way of acting and speaking, to just behold it again. You're witnessing now from your highest, wisest self the way that person was acting when there was conflict and blame. To recognize that and to allow it, let it be there. Just fully allow that person being the way that person is. 
And that allowing will let you investigate with curiosity, with interest, really what's going on. So deepening your attention, you might wonder, what was that person feeling? How might their leg have been in a trap? What might they have been going through to have them behave in that way? What were they hoping for or wanting in the interaction? As you attune, you might sense what unmeet needs they might have had, perhaps to feel respected, loved, important, understood, appreciated, or safe. And now nurture from the compassionate witness, feeling care, Imagine that person feeling their needs met, their their leg released from the trap. Feeling their needs met, and imagine how they might behave and be different. Sense who they can be. Sensing their basic goodness when they're not caught in fear or hurt or feelings of deficiency. Now bringing your attention fully right here to your own presence. And you might wonder, who am I when I'm free of blame? Sensing the space of heart and awareness that includes yourself, that other person, and all beings sensing our true belonging. As a way of closing the meditation, you might imagine uh, ways you might respond in your next encounter with this person, having more choices. And as you're ready, please open your eyes. And if you'd like, you might journal, write some notes about whatever you discovered in this meditation. Thank you very much for your attention.